Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. This week's chapel speaker was Dr. Jay Bruce. Dr. Bruce is professor of philosophy and is the director of the Center for Faith and Flourishing at JBU. He writes and lectures on philosophy, theology, politics, and economics. Good morning. Thank you. So uh, my name is Jay Bruce. I have the privilege of being a philosophy professor here and also the director of the Center for Faith and Flourishing. We've been looking at, oh, and by the way, I am wearing Chacos. I thought that maybe because I was speaking in chapel, I should depart from my uniform of a blue shirt, khaki pants, and Chacos, but then I thought I'd be unrecognizable to you students, so I'm trying to give you a, a help. We're looking uh, through Mark's gospel this morning. It's my great privilege to talk to you about greatness according to Jesus from Mark chapter 10. So you have the verse, I hope, in front of you. I'll read it before we begin. Whoever, Jesus says, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many I want to tackle this passage under two headings. Uh, I want to talk about greatness and service on the one hand and greatness in the Son of Man on the other. So you're going to have to think with me about these things. First, what kind, how does Jesus want us to coordinate in our minds? Yes, I'm highly caffeinated, so I'm a fast talker. There are subtitles if you uh, need you know, me to speak more slowly, you can just read. But anyway, so gr- greatness and service. How does Jesus coordinate these two things? How does Jesus want us to understand service and greatness? The second topic I want us to consider is greatness applied to Jesus himself, so greatness and the Son of Man. So in order to understand, there we go. So in order to understand greatness and service, that's our first topic, I want us to ask two questions. So two, I told you you would have to think. So two questions. First, is service a method to achieve greatness or is service a marker of greatness? Is service a way that I become great, or is Jesus saying here that if you are great, you will serve? That's the first question. The second question is uh, about the application of this kind of whatever coordination of greatness and service we believe in, or Jesus is teaching us, is the greatness seen in the world or in the church? So I thought of a a couple of different ways of trying to articulate this, but I I thought this would be the best way to do it. This is actually diverging from my practice that I get from John Chapman, an Australian evangelist, who says that whenever you speak, you should state, explain, illustrate, and apply. That is, that you should state what you're saying, you should explain it, you should offer an illustration, and then you apply it to your audience. Here, I'm giving almost all my illustrations right at the front. So, because imagine that I'm going to be giving a TED Talk. I don't actually watch TED Talks, but apparently, you know, you get people and they they tell you, like, there I was, raised by wolves, I was illiterate, and then, you know, now I'm a billionaire because I did X, right? That's kind of a TED Talk. So what kind of TED Talk could I give that would illustrate, that would, what would, what illustration could I give for a TED Talk that would illustrate what Jesus is saying about the coordination of greatness and service. So let's, let's take these in turn. Say I think, say Jesus is saying that greatness, it, that service is the method or the means that you achieve greatness. So you start out a loser, you serve a bunch of people, and then you become great. If that is what Jesus is saying, then maybe I'd give an example like this. I get this from Joe Wallenchuk, known to you Waltons as Walito. He told me the story that year, decades ago when what is now the baby Walmart, the Walmart neighborhood market, used to be back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, like one of the first Walmarts in the country. And uh, Walito told me the story about a young Walton girl who walked into the Walmart. She, if you've lived in a foreign country like I have, like some, some of you have, then you know exa- how exhausting it is to constantly be speaking a language that's not your native tongue. So she was exhausted with speaking English. She was homesick. It was her baby a freshman fall. And she walked into this Walmart and she just was overwhelmed with all the choices, didn't know what she was doing. And so she actually sat down in the Walmart and just started crying. And an old man wearing a baseball cap came up to her and said, honey, are you okay? And, and, and she said, well, you know, I'm, 
oh, I'm homesick. And he said, well, would you like to come over here and sit down? And she said, yeah, that'd be nice. And she, she, he, this man was just an old man with a baseball cap, had no markings on him whatsoever. And, uh, but everybody in the store paid him deference. So she sits down, feels a little better. Would you like a cup of coffee? Because this is America and everybody drinks coffee. She said yes, right? So uh, she gets coffee and she says to this man who's so kind to her, who's so servant oriented, sir, what's your name? Sam, what's your last name? Walton. So one way of preaching this passage is illustrating it with the life of Sam Walton and saying, Sam Walton became great in the world because he was dedicated to serving his customers. Is that what Jesus wants us to take away in Mark chapter 10, that the way that you become great in the world is through serving others? That's option number one. Maybe Jesus is saying, well, you do the same thing, but it's in the church. So here's another illustration. In 1979, a man moved to Orange Ca County, California with his wife. He, they started a Bible study in their condo in 1980. They decided, this little Bible study, I think it was seven people, decided to go thousands of dollars into debt, mostly on their personal credit cards, in order to try to reach people for Jesus. They personally paid for the rent of school. They bought some audiovisual equipment. They paid for some marketing. And the man's name is one you know, because that church grew into Saddleback Church with over 20,000 people in weekly attendance across different campuses. So, Rick Warren, is that what Jesus is saying here, that the way that you become great in the church is that you serve, 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 serve people, and then you achieve some kind of greatness, that, that service is the method or the means whereby you achieve greatness? Is that what Jesus is saying? Conversely, maybe Jesus is saying that, that service is a marker of greatness, that if you, if you serve people well, it shows that prior to your service, you are already great. Now, if I wanted to illustrate this uh, with an example from the world, I'd take this one. When this girl turned 18 in 1945, the world was at war, and she decided to join the Auxiliary Territorial Service, which the, was the women's branch of the British Army. And though she was extremely well-connected, neither she nor her father sought for her to achieve a higher rank. She was a second subaltern, which I think is the, uh, was the women's equivalent of a second lieutenant. She trained as a driver and as a mechanic. And there's a picture of her showing that she's showing her father and her sister the work that she's been doing on the engine of this vehicle. Well, when war ended in Europe in 1945, she and that sister, like all of London, were celebrating, and she later spoke of lines of unknown people linking arms and arm, arm and arm and walking down Whitehall, and all of us were swept along by tides of happiness and relief. But there was a little fear, too, she confessed later. I remember we were terrified of being recognized. So I pulled my uniform, uniform cap well down over my eyes. Why? Why would this person who served as a driver and mechanic in the Auxiliary Territorial Service be concerned about being noticed? Because she was Princess Elizabeth. And within a, man, a matter of years, I think it was two years later, she became Queen Elizabeth II on the death of her father, George VI. Liz served her country well. She served her country well. And uh, she's quite, I've never met the queen, but um, she, uh, there's a charming story where she was at her castle in Scotland and uh, uh, she of course had a bodyguard and so she's, she bumps into uh, uh, American tourists and they don't recognize her. And, uh, but they know that they're walking on the queen's castle. And so the Queen's grounds. And so these American tourists eagerly asked this old British woman, have you ever met the Queen? And she said, no. And then pointed to her bodyguard and said, but he has. He has. So Liz served her country well. Is that what Jesus is saying? That you are great in the world. 
you're great in the world, and you evidence that greatness by your service of your country, your people, your, your corporation, or whatever. I like to be direct. If you've ever uh, received feedback from me on a paper, then you'll know that I want to say, no, that is not what Jesus is saying. In order to illustrate this, we're going to use the life of John the Baptist, and then I also want us to consider the life of Jesus himself. John the Baptist served the Lord Jesus Christ, and his service is a marker of his greatness. I, uh, I cheated you out of the, uh, the first part of the context of Mark. I, gave, I read the second sentence of Mark 43, 1043 to 45. But listen to the whole context here, 42 to 45. And Jesus called to them and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It shall not be so among you. Jesus is talking about the church. And I think greatness, according to Jesus, is that we use our the gifts, the talents, the skills, the abilities, the passions that he's given us in service of others. John offers an example of this greatness. In Mark chapter 1, right at the start of the gospel, Mark quotes from Isaiah, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the paths for the Lord. And then he goes and he tells us immediately about John. And John is not an impressive character by the world's standards. He's clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey, so he would have fit in right well in J. Alvin. <laughs> how, did God, uh, how did John die? Did John die a multi-billionaire? Did he have a, a successful global ministry? No. Mark chapter 1, Mark introduces us to John. By Mark chapter 6... By Mark chapter 6, a coward, King Herod, because of his oath and his guests, gives John's head on a platter to the daughter of Herodias. We would not, I think, normally, if we were honest, say, that's greatness in ministry. That's what I want to do. I want a cowardly king to give my head to a girl because the king was enticed by her dancing and the king was married to her mother who also happened to be his brother Philip's wife. This does not sound like the gospel ministry that some of us want to have. And yet, John has a laser focus on bringing glory to Jesus through his service. Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, you know he's baptizing people, and what does he say? After me comes he who's mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And what does John the Baptist say in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 3, verse 30? He must increase. I must decrease. He must become greater. I must become less. And what does Jesus say about John? Does Jesus say, well, that's a little embarrassing. Does Jesus say, well, John the Baptist kind of pushed the, the envelope too much. He shouldn't have spoken too much truth to power. No, we read in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 11, truly I say to you, this is Jesus speaking about John, among those born of women, there has arisen no greater than John the Baptist. You see, John was willing and he was able. And greatness in life, greatness in service is being willing and able. This should take the pressure off of us, JBU. So often, I think, we um, couch our own ambition and the language of service because we really are 
seeking our own greatness. We are really seeking our own glory. But if we know that God has given us rich talents, treasure, and ability to serve others, it takes the pressure off. It takes the pressure off. John was willing to serve Jesus and able to serve Jesus, and we may look, people may look, people certainly did look at his life and say, what a loser. But that is not Jesus' assessment. So what about you? What about you? Your greatness in the church should be demonstrated in service to others. Your, your talents, your treasure, your ability. You see, sometimes we are able to help people, but we're not willing. Right? We have the, the contacts, we have the knowledge, but we just don't, we don't want to bother. Sometimes we are willing, but we're just not able. I'm going to try to say this without weeping. But uh, if you go to the cemetery here, you will see Philip Henry Bruce. And that is our son that we buried six years ago this month. And I say with all my heart that if I could pour out my life for him, I would do it every time. But there are occasions in life that however willing you are, you are just not able to do it. So if God presents you with opportunities where you are both willing and able to serve, then serve. And if you are able to serve, but you're just not so sure, then look at John the Baptist. Look at the way of Jesus. The mark of the Christian is suffering now, glory later. If you look at the Gospels, Acts chapter 5, they're beaten, and what do they say when they leave? They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. What does the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians 9? He says, I'm free, I'm free, but I've become a servant of all that I might win some. What does he say in Philippians chapter 2? Even if I'm poured out like a drink offering, even if my life is just poured out before the Lord, then glory to Christ, glory to Christ. So what about you? Will you get off your derriere and will you actually serve people? Or is it just going to be about you? Don't make that mistake. Greatness is given to you so that you can serve others. Now, I promised you two topics. First, greatness and service, and now I want to focus on greatness and the Son of Man. Service marks the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. So, Let's first focus here on the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Don't let these words wash over you. This would have been astonishing to people in Jesus' day. It would have been uh, confusing, distracting. So, the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 is the one that Daniel sees in a vision who's presented to the Ancient of Days, and what is given to him It's given to him dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So when Jesus says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, you can imagine that his disciples may have thought, um, well, hasn't Jesus read the book of Daniel? And I think that this helps us understand the three times Jesus foretells his death and his disciples just don't get it. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Dr. Vila mentioned it several weeks ago. What is, what is, what happens when, when Jesus foretells his death in Mark chapter 8, verse 31? Peter rebukes him. 
I'm just making this up. It's not in the Bible. You're not conscience bound to believe it. But we could imagine that Jesus, it, Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, Jesus, haven't you read Daniel chapter 7? Haven't you read it? That's not what happens to the Son of Man. You've been calling yourself the Son of Man. You get power, glory, and dominion so that everybody in the world serves you. You're not going to die. That, haven't you read your Daniel? Mark chapter 9, verse 31, Jesus a second time foretells his death. What does Mark say the, uh, the reaction of the disciples is? They're too scared to ask him. Then in Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, right before the passage we're considering, again, Jesus says, hey, look, they're gonna, I'm going to be betrayed, they're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise from the dead. And that's right on the back of that, the two of his disciples ask for greatness in his kingdom. They just don't get it. But we do, or we should, the greatness of the Son of Man, the greatness of the Son of Man is demonstrated in His service. It's demonstrated in His service. And how does He serve us? Well, Mark 10, 45 makes it clear. He gives His life as a ransom for many. Now, a ransom is a, a payment of deliverance from being a slave or a prisoner of war. If we were, if it was Brusitania versus your country, and, uh, and Brusitania won, then we would kill you all, or we would take some of you as prisoner of war, and you would basically be slaves. And how would you get out of slavery from the kingdom of Brusitania? Well, somebody would buy you out. Somebody would buy you out. And I put here, it's not gratuitous manumission. When Jesus says he's our ransom, it's not like, Death and hell just say like, okay, we're done. We're done with Jay. Here, take him. That's not what Jesus is saying. It's not a daring rescue, right? Jesus isn't a commando coming to liberate you. Instead, it's a genuine satisfaction. His life for your life. His life for your life. This uh, passage that I reference in Exodus 21, 28 to 30 is about if, uh, say, Dr. Vila has an ox and it's been, you know, it gores somebody, well, then that's, that's pretty bad. But Exodus points out that if the, the, the Vila bull was known for, for uh, attacking students, then things could get really bad because um, it's clear that he's not been taking care of his bull and it's been injuring a lot of people. And so they, they say, kill the ox, but also kill the man. Except, what? If he pays a ransom price. You can, if he pays a ransom price. And the key here in Mark's gospel is that you cannot pay the ransom for your life. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus says, it's not the world that's messing you up. I mean, the world may be messing you up, and I apologize for that on behalf of the world. But there's all sorts of horrible things just coming, spewing out of you. And Jesus says, that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And so that means that you are a slave. Ha! Ah, I'm not a slave, Bruce, you say to yourself. Well, you think of me at 2 o'clock this morning when you are indulging whatever addiction is your favorite addiction. You're a slave to your sin. You're a slave. And only Jesus can ransom you from your slavery. As Dr. Vila reminded us when he talked about Mark chapter 8, we just sang, in Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. And only Jesus can get you out. Only Jesus can rescue you. But the question is, is he willing and is he able? And the answer is yes. Jesus is both willing and able I wouldn't be a philosophy professor if I didn't quote Aristotle. And Aristotle in, in Nicomachean Ethics, he actually uses the same word, uh, ransom. And he talks about how the hierarchy of ransom, right? That a man should ransom his father. Why? Because his father gave him life. And so there's a kind of hierarchical, you, you know, you, a, a lesser would ransom a superior. But here, Jesus is crucified between two thieves, for violent rebels, for people who are of no worth. You see, the greatness that you have is only a gift. It's only a gift. And you know what we do 
with the talents, the treasure, the blessings of God. We corrupt them. We misuse them. We, we use the language that the Lord has given us to hurt people's feelings. We, we covet things that are not ours. And yet, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that you're not forsaken. He emptied himself, as Paul says in Philippians 2, taking the form of a servant. And he was obedient for your sake, even to death on the cross. And that is the heart of the gospel. That's why we can say, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and to pardon me. His life for your life. This is a second or third, I asked Michael Francis about this. He said this is second or third century. It's an anonymous author, but this is a historic Christian witness here to exactly what we have at the cross. The Father, He gave His own Son as a ransom for us, the Holy One for transgressors, the blameless One for the wicked, the righteous One for the unrighteous, the incorruptible One for the corruptible, the immortal One for them that are mortal. For what other thing can, was capable of covering our sins than His righteousness? No other thing was capable of covering our sins but His righteousness, and yet He poured out His blood. We have been washed with His blood. We have been clothed in His righteousness. And as Sandra McCracken led us in singing on Tuesday, we will feast in the house of Zion. And we will weep no more. We will rejoice because He is a great servant to, to us. As we sang in Christ alone, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. I end with a question Will you be among the many? Will you be among the many? Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. When, when I was your age, when I was your age, I was invincible in my own mind. If I was crossing the street and there was a huge truck barreling down the road, I thought to myself, well, he better slow down, right? Because I'm going to break his fender, right? I mean, just I felt totally indestructible, totally indestructible. But I'm telling you, life is fragile. Life is short. It was just but a moment ago in 2008, and I was hired, and I was sitting right over there, and I was just about to speak, and I turned to a student and I said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of nervous. And he looked at me and he said, well, only me and my friends are zealots and will pay attention to what you say, and we all love you. That student, it's so typical JBU, that student loved another student, they got married, of course they went and became missionaries, of course they had a bunch of kids, but I buried him in April. I buried him. You've got to realize life is short. And Joel Tigreen, a JBU alumnus who left behind a widow, a JBU alumna, and five children, he died well. Right before he died, he made videos with each child saying, do not be bitter towards God because he is taking your father. That is a man who knows that Christ's wounds paid his ransom. That is a man who knows that suffering now, glory later. That is a man who knows that when push comes to shove, when life gets hard, when you are deep down in a ditch of despair and you think to yourself, no one loves me, you look to the cross. His wounds have paid your ransom. I'm going to be teaching, this is kind of a shameless plug, but it's not. I'm going to be teaching uh, two classes that I've never taught before. One is uh, uh, Selected Topics and Justice. We're going to look at four different um, kinds of justice, and I've done a lot of work in writing on justice, and so I think everybody should know something about justice. 
I'm also going to, the biology departments asked me to teach bioethics, which is greatly helped by my almost magisterial knowledge of ethics, but is hindered by my almost complete ignorance of biology. So we'll see how, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But I'm telling you, JBU students, if there is one truth that you could know that would carry you through your whole life, it would not be what hylomorphic dualism is, right? It, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't be some kind of technical, abstruse philosophy, even though I love philosophy. I love it. It would be that you could say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Right here at the end, let me mention that Mark has three different responses to Jesus in Mark chapter 10. The little children come to him. Blind Bartimaeus calls out to him. Be like them. Jesus, help me. I am weak. Jesus, free me. I am enslaved. Jesus, forgive me because I've sinned. Be like them. Don't be like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and went away sad, sorrowful, and lost. Trust in the one who gave his life for you. Let's pray. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the one, the true, and the only God, we worship and adore you. We thank you that you have loved us, you have bled and died for us, that you've bought us with your blood. And Lord, we pray that if there is anyone here who does not know the joy of sins forgiven, who does not see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that he or she would turn to you in saving faith. And it's in your strong and powerful name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on, and we'd love it if you would leave us a review.